Welcome to session number 38 of Old Testament Survey. Uh, this session will take us uh, briefly into the book of Hosea and then on into the book of Isaiah. Hosea and Isaiah are actually two different guys. Hosea is the, uh, uh, the first prophet in the sequence of the minor prophets. He's actually the, um, the third of the writing prophets. Uh, he comes just after Amos and Joel that we covered uh, uh, on Monday. Uh, Hosea uh, is, like all of the minor prophets, uh, is unique. The, the prophets all have their own thing going. They're all, uh, they all have a storyline. And um, Hosea is interesting. Uh, you'll find Hosea at the beginning of the collection of the 12 minor prophets. He comes immediately after Daniel, which in turn comes after Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah, Lamentations, and Ezekiel. So you get the, the major prophets. Then you've got Daniel, which the Jews don't even consider a prophet exactly. They consider him a writing. Uh, and then the 12 minor prophets. It would be nice if the minor prophets were in chronological order, but they're not, and so I end up sprinkling them around. Hosea comes at this point. He's about the middle of the 8th century. Figure Hosea fits about, oh, uh, 750 or so BC. Um, let me uh, bring up the screen. I'll show you some background. Not, not that one, this one. There we go. Uh, Baal worship was the big challenge facing Israel at, uh, at this time. Uh, it had been forced underground by Jehu. We talked about Jehu a couple of sessions ago. Uh, Jehu was king for a good long time, and he killed a whole bunch of priests of Baal and Baal worshipers. Uh, he was a pretty, uh, pretty brutal character. Uh, but what Jehu didn't do was to dismantle the temples at Dan and Bethel. Uh, the, the picture here is the temple at Dan in the north. We have yet to find uh, the temple at Bethel. Uh, there, uh, there is a city identified with Bethel, but it's probably the wrong place, primarily because there is no temple there. There's no, uh, no golden calf temple. Uh, these are the steps leading up to the main altar of the uh, uh, golden calf temple at Dan. Uh, Hosea specifically calls this Baal worship. Uh, it uh, clearly included sacred prostitution and uh, child sacrifice. Uh, so this was, a, this was a very, very bad thing. Uh, uh, we're not sure which particular gods were worshiped in addition to Baal. Uh, Molech is one of the most popular, uh, and of course Ishtar and Asherah, the, uh, the so-called goddesses, the prostitute goddesses. Uh, Molech was worshipped by the, uh, 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 the sacrifice of children in a fire, uh, and uh, this was uh, a gruesome thing. It's the equivalent of modern abortion. Uh, a truly, truly awful thing. So Hosea uh, is uh, wading into the uh, northern kingdom uh, at a time of uh, a, a real spiritual low point. As I guess that's the best thing to call this. Uh, the author of Hosea is uh, virtually unknown. Uh, his authorship, of course, is attacked by the critics. Uh, you've gotten used to that particular line. Uh, just about every uh, prophet in the, uh, in the Old Testament is attacked by the critics. Uh, there's no substance to the arguments. 
Uh, you've got some people with a lot of letters behind their names uh, saying that uh, Hosea didn't write it, uh, but they don't supply any actual evidence. They just have their theories. Uh, so I don't bother with them. Uh, I've, uh, I've read their theories. Uh, I understand their theories as much as uh, they are uh, sensible. I, and uh, they don't make any difference. Uh, so I, I've moved on to other things. Uh, Hosea's ministry lasted for about 38 years. Uh, there's some, uh, uh, some uh, tags in his book that help us to follow that. From about 753 to about 715, uh, he didn't write about the fall of Samaria. Uh, that happened in 722 BC. So he must have finished his written work by that time. He certainly would have included a note about the fall of Samaria if he was still writing by then. Uh, that's a bit of a mystery for us. We don't understand why we know that he, he did go down to about 715. Okay, the uh, uh, most important uh, illustration in the book is Hosea's marriage. Uh, he's, uh, uh, he's told in the, uh, the first lines of the book, uh, in uh, uh, verse, uh, verse 2 of chapter 1, to go and take for yourself a wife of uh, adultery, prostitution, or uh, the uh, literal translation of the Hebrew word whoredom, which is rather a, uh, uh, a crude word, uh, so I don't usually use that. Uh, but uh, was, uh, was Hosea's wife an active temple prostitute? Uh, the simple answer is we don't know for sure. Uh, there are at least four views that are taken about uh, Hosea's marriage to uh, Gomer, who is a wife of adultery, um, an immoral woman in some ways. Uh, the um, classic view, uh, especially amongst uh, the Jews, uh, is that this is allegorical. No marriage ever happened. It's a symbol of Israel's spiritual decline. Uh, and it, it never happened. Uh, the problem is there are too many details. Uh, and uh, the details are not given allegorical names like the slew of despond or the, uh, you know, the, the unfaithful man and that sort of thing. There's, there are no signals of allegory. There are no singles of sim symbols of, uh, or, or signals of uh, figurative language. Uh, the the book itself speaks of an actual marriage. So the allegorical view is very unlikely. Um, a uh, uh, second view and the opposite of the first uh, is uh, what we call the real marriage uh, stroke unchaste Gomer view. Gomer is the, uh, is the lady in question. And this means that uh, a real marriage actually happened. Uh, Hosea uh, went out and uh, uh, took uh, took this woman as his wife with a real marriage, uh, and she was at the time of the marriage uh, uh, literally a, a prostitute or at least uh, a an adulterous woman. That was her character, and that's what she did uh, on a regular basis. Uh, now that is. Uh, frankly, that's the easiest view. That's the most straightforward understanding of the words on the page. A lot of interpreters have had trouble with this, saying that it would provide an ethical dilemma for a man like Hosea. Uh, Hosea is a godly man. Uh, he could not possibly have done a thing like that. Uh, other interpreters have said, well, that's the point. Uh, Hosea didn't marry Gomer because she was a good woman. Uh, there's a bit of an echo. Yes, I know. It's several not muted. Uh, I, I think uh, yours is muted. I'm hearing it online. I, I'm on. I'm on. Okay. Let me see here. If I can mute everybody. Uh, see anybody unmuted? 
Okay. Now, is there still an echo? There is still an echo. Okay, I'm going to kill this one. That way I don't have my iPad up. It was in the iPad. Okay. All right, sorry about that. Uh, so the allegorical view is unlikely. The real marriage, unchaste Gomer view. Uh, I agree with the interpreters who say this is the point of the exercise. Uh, salvation isn't about God going to look for perfect people. Uh, the, the point of salvation is that God goes out to seek and to save the lost. Uh, so the image, disagreeable as it uh, is to us, is uh, uh, probably correct. Now there are some who say that the, this is merely a spiritual infidelity. But for a godly man, this doesn't solve any problems. Uh, there are some who say that the marriage is real, but Gomer was a nice lady when uh, uh, Hosea married her. Uh, this uh, solves the problem for Hosea, some claim, but uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really answer to the symbolism of, uh, of the whole passage. So I take the second view that real marriage uh, and uh, adulterous uh, Gomer, she was probably a temple prostitute. Uh, that would be the uh, the simplest use of uh, of the language, uh, and the the point of that uh, is really what we're going to find in the uh, theology of Hosea. The the whole point of the book of Hosea uh, is that uh, God's love for Israel is a uh, covenant keeping love. Uh, God has uh, taken Israel up out of the desert and made her a great nation. Uh, she has rejected that covenant, but God has never stopped loving Israel. Uh, so the, the, uh, uh, the message of, uh, of Hosea is a, uh, a call to repentance. It's a call to uh, Israel, the northern kingdom, to repent and to return to the Lord. Uh, and uh, Hosea uses his own unhappy mess, uh, marriage to Gomer as an object lesson in the ministry. Uh, Hosea is a, uh, is a frequent uh, warner of uh, the coming judgment. There's a whole bunch of uh, uh, passages in Hosea that describe the coming day of the Lord. Uh, the, the pattern of Hosea follows the patterns of uh, all of the other uh, Old Testament prophets who bring up these themes. Uh, there is a, a judgment coming on Israel. Okay, that's one. Uh, then later, there is a restoration of Israel yet to come. Although Israel is uh, doing evil and will be punished for her sins, yet the day is coming when Israel will be redeemed and restored to her position. She will be punished uh, by a removal from the land. Uh, and this, is, this happens over a, a, a period of time, actually uh, uh, roughly half a millennium. Uh, the northern kingdom is removed by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom is removed by uh, the Babylonians. Uh, later on, they, they come back for a while, but they're forced into a diaspora again by the Romans. Uh, a, a, a few continue to live in the land until finally, about 100 years ago, the beginnings of the restoration of Israel seem to have happened. So what we have here is a very, very long trajectory. Uh, God's plan for Israel is not something that is fulfilled uh, in the attack by some Assyrians or uh, an exile by the Babylonians or, or whatever. Uh, these temporal events are generally images of a, of a larger spiritual reality. 
uh, Israel has rejected the Lord and is therefore suffering these waves of judgment, of punishment for her sin. But that punishment doesn't eliminate God's love. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the book of, uh, of Hosea starts out with the illustration of the um, adulterous wife. Uh, Hosea marries uh, Gomer, uh, who is probably a temple prostitute, uh, not a nice lady. He has children by Gomer, uh, because that's, that's how marriage works. Uh, uh, and Hosea does the right thing. Uh, but, but Gomer continues with her adultery. She continues to be an evil person. Uh, and the infidelity is a, uh, is a symbol, an illustration of uh, Israel's willingness to walk away from God. So in chapters 4 through uh, 14, we see Israel's indictment. The indictment is the, uh, the judicial list of all of the bad stuff. Uh, and we see that uh, uh, sequentially in chapters 4 through 7. Uh, and this is quite a catalog. Uh, if, if you uh, read through 4 through 7, beginning at uh, 4.1, uh, is four chapters of uh, a listing of all of the bad things that Israel has done. Uh, and I'd like to ask, uh, and Hosea doesn't provide any answers here, but I'd like to ask, did Israel ever do anything right? Uh, I mean, this, is, this just sounds awful. Uh, and Hosea would probably answer me, uh, yes, that's accurate, this is awful. <laughs> There's nothing good uh, in uh, uh, Israel's history. It's all bad. You can count on that. Take it to the bank. Uh, in uh, chapters uh, 8 through 10, 8, 9, and 10, uh, is essentially a warning of the Assyrian captivity. Uh, the northern kingdom will be uh, invaded by Tiglath-Pileser in 732 BC. It will then be invaded again by uh, uh, Sargon and Shalmaneser. Uh, Sargon was the main king and it was his invasion, but he died halfway through. Uh, and so uh, he, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the pitcher who was brought in to finish the game is called Shalmaneser II. And it's uh, Shalmaneser's uh, win in his column. Uh, he's the one who in 722 uh, destroyed and burned the city of Samaria. Uh, and uh, exiled uh, as many of the people as he could out of uh, the northern kingdoms, the 10 northern tribes. Uh, he deliberately scattered those people to the farthest possible uh, locations of uh, the Assyrian uh, controlled land. Uh, at the same time, he exiled other people from other places, Gentiles, uh, back to uh, the, the land surrounding Samaria. Uh, this is the beginning of a, the people group that we call the Samaritan people. The Samaritans were a mixed race. Uh, there were some very, uh, very poor Israelites uh, who uh, had no possessions and no homes to be exiled from. They simply belonged on the land. They were the peasants. Uh, and they were joined by exiles from all over the rest of the Assyrian Empire, various Gentiles. Uh, and the uh, intermarriage of those peoples resulted in the Samaritan people group. Now, interestingly, the Samaritans have a copy of the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses. And at the time of Christ, uh, the Samaritans were a disliked people group. They lived in uh, the area around Shechem. Uh, but at that time, they still believed that they were worshiping the one true God. Uh, they believed that God should be worshiped there on Mount uh, Gerizim in Shechem. Um, 
and that's uh, that's what their Samaritan Pentateuch tells them. Uh, it's an interesting side note. It's not uh, not terribly important for a whole lot of history, but that destroys the entire Northern Kingdom, and that's what's being warned of in uh, uh, chapters uh, nine through ten. Uh, chapters eleven through 14 of Hosea, give us some details of the uh, restoration of uh, Israel. 11.1, uh, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Uh, verse three, it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them by, I, up by their arms. and They did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness and with the bands of love. Uh, verse, uh, verse 8, uh, how can I give you up, O Israel? How can I ever hand you over, O Israel? Uh, the, uh, the picture here is of God's uh, faithfulness in spite of Israel's rebellion. Um, uh, verse uh, verse 12, more indictments. I am the Lord your God, verse 9, from the land of Egypt. I will again make you dwell in tents as in the days of the appointed feasts. Uh, more judgment in chapter 13. Uh, we finally get a plea to return to the Lord in, uh, in chapter, uh, chapter 14. Uh, this, is, uh, this is about uh, about the end of it. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Um, in uh, verse 4, there is a promise of uh, redemption. Finally, at the end of this whole book, there's a, a promise of redemption. Uh, I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall take root like the trees of Lebanon. <laughs> okay, so finally it's going to be okay. Uh, and uh, at the very end, whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. In other words, this is a difficult principle. God doesn't save us because we are good. God saves us because he is good, uh, because he is faithful to his promises. Um, when, when we reject him, he will see to it that our punishment is severe. But he never stops loving us. Uh, we, make a, uh, we make a false uh, contrast when we say uh, that uh, God is always angry with uh, those who hate him and will send them to hell. Uh, but uh, uh, good people, God will reward, and uh, they get to come to heaven. God doesn't, doesn't, God doesn't re reward us uh, uh, with heaven for being good. He gives us heaven as a free gift out of his grace. Uh, when we are good, we can have the blessings of our walk with him. Uh, and when we are bad, it turns out very, very bad. Uh, and uh, uh, God's punishment of his own people uh, is uh, very severe. Uh, and there's, a, there's a set of principles that uh, most non-Christians never any, ever get close to, and most Christians never really truly understand. Um, uh, God's grace and God's faithfulness uh, work together here in a very important way. Okay, that's all I'm going to do with Hosea. Hosea actually is a, a really neat book. There's a lot more to be said about that. Uh, but in order to do justice to a, uh, a survey, <laughs> yeah, a survey of the book, we have to go on to Isaiah. Now, if you've read Isaiah, you know this is a great big book. It's the uh, longest book uh, among the prophets with 66 chapters. It's only exceeded by uh, the Psalms, and most of the Psalms have much shorter chapters. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of material in the book of Isaiah. 
the background of this one, by the way, is a, a, a very famous model of the uh, city of Jerusalem. This is, uh, it used to be in the uh, uh, forecourt of the Holy Land Hotel in Jerusalem, uh, but I understand they've moved it, uh, and I don't know where they put it, uh, but it's a, uh, it's a model of ancient Jerusalem uh, at about the time of Christ. Uh, it is kept updated by the archaeologists every time they find some new building or structure. They try to update the model uh, so that uh, tourists in particular, but scholars also, uh, can go and see what the uh, entire city would likely have looked like. So that's the temple that you see in the background. Uh, the uh, temple of Herod's day was quite a bit bigger than the temple of Isaiah's day. Uh, nevertheless, when we get to the call of Isaiah, uh, that's going to happen here in Jerusalem, a big city with all of the uh, uh, all of the trimmings of a uh, of a big and mighty city. Uh, historically, uh, Isaiah uh, lived in interesting times. Uh, there's a, an old Chinese curse that goes, "May you live in interesting times," and, and Isaiah certainly. Uh, had that uh, uh, to the hilt. He wrote during the time period 740 to 690 BC. Uh, so this uh, time span includes uh, the Assyrian Empire. This is an Assyrian king uh, on a relief from Nineveh. Uh, the Assyrians came in uh, and were the major problem during Isaiah's entire uh, lifespan, during his, uh, his career. Uh, but he predicts also the coming of the Babylonians. We're going to see a, a, a little episode with a Babylonian king by the name of Merodach Baladan. I know that's easy for me to say. Uh, but Merodach Baladan is going to come around 714 or so, 712 to 14 BC. Uh, and uh, you know, get some previews of coming attractions roughly a hundred years before the Babylonians finally uh, come to uh, Jerusalem as uh, enemies. At this time, the Assyrians are the, uh, the major power. Uh, as I've mentioned before, Assyria was not an empire. It's wrong really for us to speak of an Assyrian empire. Uh, Assyria was really little more than a protection racket. Uh, like uh, in our country these days, we have, uh, have a group called Antifa, uh, which uh, uh, claims to be uh, opposed to the fascists, but actually they are, they're just communists uh, and they, uh, they hate good order altogether. Uh, and they will, uh, uh, they will go to uh, uh, big businesses uh, say if you'd uh, like us for uh, like for us not to burn down your stores, you need to give us money, and we will uh, we will protect you. Uh, the mafia used to do that. Uh, now today it's uh, terrorist groups like uh, Antifa. Uh, this is becoming a worldwide thing today. I I wonder sometimes if uh, if we are. Uh, seeing a repetition of history, if the Assyrians are not merely historical, but if there's something modern still coming. So the Assyrians would run around uh, from one place to another uh, with their chariots and their purple-robed kings, and they would uh, go to uh, the, the cities that surrounded their so-called empire and demand uh, all the money. And they uh, uh, a, a token of slaves. A certain number of people from every city had to be given as slaves to the Assyrians every year. Uh, it was um, it was evil. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, people of the ancient world, uh, generally speaking, hated the Assyrians. Uh, they were a despised people group. A uh, hundred years after Isaiah. Uh, we're going to see the fall of Assyria to the Babylonians. Uh, and the Babylonians were a, a, a cruel and ruthless people themselves, uh, but they at least built an actual empire. 
Uh, and generally speaking, at least for the first 50 years or so, uh, the uh, peoples of the ancient world uh, were content under the Babylonians in a way that they had never been under the Assyrian uh, oppression. Uh, the, the first big king that uh, uh, is important in uh, Isaiah's uh, narrative is Tiglath-Pileser. Uh, who devastated the areas of the north, uh, the northern kingdom, uh, in uh, 735. Uh, Shalmaneser attacks uh, uh, the uh, uh, capital, Samaria, in 727. Uh, and then, it, oh, I got this wrong. It's uh, Sargon who finally destroyed the city. So Shalmaneser does the, uh, the advance work uh, Sargon finally destroys the city in 722 BC. Uh, the next great Assyrian uh, enterprise is a siege of Jerusalem under Sennacherib in 701 BC. Uh, if I hadn't turned off my iPad, I'd give you a timeline of this. But remember, 735 or thereabouts, 722 or thereabouts, and 701. 1 BC. The 701 date is uh, very well attested. Uh, we know that uh, Sennacherib, the Assyrian king, surrounded Jerusalem in uh, September of 701 BC. We know that he came up to a place called Lachish uh, in the summer months just before going up to Jerusalem. Uh, we know that uh, Hezekiah uh, apparently sent tribute to Sennacherib at Lachish. So there's an awful lot of historical stuff that, that we know happened. Uh, the Bible is not a storybook for children uh, or a mythology book for uh, people who want uh, a mythology book. Uh, it's history. Uh, and God is operating in the realm of uh, history. Uh, when Sennacherib surrounded uh, Jerusalem, he writes in his later annals in the city of uh, Nineveh that he shut up Hezekiah, the king of the Jews, like a bird in a cage. A simpler way of saying that would be Sennacherib may have laid siege to the city, but he never actually took it. The city was not defeated. Uh, the city was surrounded, but never defeated. And that, uh, that would be true. Uh, the, uh, uh, the city of Jerusalem uh, continued to exist and would go on for another hundred years. Uh, following Sennacherib's siege of Jerusalem, we're told in, uh, uh, later on in Isaiah, chapter 30, uh, 37, that uh, 185,000 Assyrian soldiers uh, were slain by the angel of the Lord uh, outside the city of, uh, of Jerusalem. So, um, Israel in the north uh, continued to enjoy prosperity. Uh, the uh, the South continued in its prosperity. There'd been the two relatively prosperous reigns, long reigns of Jeroboam II in the North, Uzziah in the South. And it's in the year that King Uzziah died that we see Isaiah rising up to his, uh, his ministry. Um, this was a time, generally speaking, of... Uh, economic prosperity and spiritual decline. Okay, uh, the authorship and unity of the book of Isaiah is, of course, questioned by the critics. Uh, you, you should get used to this. Uh, liberal critics have claimed, uh, they have assumed that Isaiah didn't write his book. Uh, it was actually written by three other guys by the name of Isaiah. Uh, actually not, that's not what they say. Uh, they, they claim to find a first Isaiah, a second Isaiah, and a third Isaiah. 
uh, the problem that the critics have with the book of Isaiah uh, is that Isaiah predicts a lot of things that happen after his lifetime. Uh, some happen uh, uh, during the uh, uh, Babylonian captivity. Some happen after the Babylonian captivity. Some happen uh, with the first coming of Christ. Some happen surrounding the second coming of Christ and the millennial kingdom, for heaven's sakes. Uh, and uh, those things, the, the things that are going to happen in the future, the critics say, uh, are uh, um, all allegorical. They have nothing to do with anything, nothing to see here. Uh, the, the parts of Isaiah that are about the first coming of Christ, the critics say, uh, we Christians are just uh, reading our own biases into the book. Uh, and the predictions of things to come for Israel uh, were not predictions at all, since uh, predicting the future is impossible. They were actually written after the fact by three other guys. Um, for those of us who believe uh, that there is a God in heaven who raised Jesus from the dead, uh, the authorship of Isaiah is not a problem. Uh, we the God who could create heaven and earth uh, clearly knows the end from the beginning. Uh, he has no trouble predicting the future uh, and in many places claims that he does nothing without speaking through his servants, the prophets. So the idea of predictive prophecy is not difficult for believers. Uh, Isaiah is looking forward to uh, a time of judgment by the Assyrians, then by the Babylonians. Uh, he's looking forward to a, a time of exile and a return from exile. He's looking well forward to the, uh, the first coming and the suffering of Christ, and way beyond that, past the church age, all the way to the time of the, uh, the kingdom, the messianic kingdom on earth and ultimately to the new creation of heaven and earth and the eternal state. Isaiah does not have a small or uh, what we would call parochial view. Uh, and, uh, uh, the, the critics have, have rejected God. Uh, they don't believe that the Bible is uh, uh, reliable in any sense. Uh, and I have no time for them. Uh, I've, uh, uh, in, in my own work, I, I've done very little to, uh, to attempt to disprove the critics, because the critics are, uh, they are pagans for the most part, and I have no time for them. Uh, I think it would be a good thing if the critics would spend more time understanding the message of Isaiah, uh, because ultimately, the, the message of Isaiah is the strongest uh, statement in the Old Testament of the doctrine of salvation. Uh, Isaiah has the most sweeping theology of the Old Testament. His view of God and of salvation grows out of a personal experience with the Lord at a unique depth of revelation that was given to him. Uh, by the way, Pastor Joel, I want you to look at this particular picture this is a picture that I really like, and it's right in your home stomping grounds. Uh, this is in a church in uh, actually near Ravenna. This is uh, Santa Polinaire in Class. Class is a, uh, a village to the south of the old city of Ravenna, about eight kilometers, seven or eight kilometers just past the aqueduct. Uh, it uh, used to be a, a port city, uh, and this church was built in the uh, 5th century. Uh, and uh, what I like about it is the resurrection cross in mosaic. Uh, this picture doesn't do justice to the thing. It's, it's gigantic. Uh, but there you see Jesus not hanging on the cross, as is so standard in modern Catholic churches, but way up at the top, seated in heaven, surrounded by angels. Uh, and, and that's the way it ought to be, the resurrection cross. Uh, Isaiah has a resurrection theology. Uh, he has a very, very high view of God. 
Uh, he, he views God as the sovereign king, the creator of the universe, who plans and executes the end from the beginning. Uh, God is the ruler of the nations. He's the mover behind the events of history. In the midst of his, this infinite power, God is unutterably holy, so holy he can't countenance sin. Man in his sight is a sin-filled worm worthy of destruction, and yet graciously provided with salvation, the forgiveness of sin. It's an amazing vision. It's a, uh, an extremely broad and comprehensive vision. Uh, Isaiah's concept of redemption is enormous, uh, and it lays the foundation uh, for the theology of the New Testament. Uh, Isaiah is in every way possible the, the summary of Old Testament theology. Uh, this is uh, a particularly uh, the theology of uh, salvation. Even Isaiah's name is meaningful. All Old Testament names have meanings, but Isaiah means salvation is of the Lord. Uh, Yesachia, uh, salvation is of the Lord. Uh, the uh, centerpiece of Isaiah's theology is, of course, the messianic emphasis. Uh, there are many modern scholars, and I'm not going to bother naming any of them, uh, even some conservatives, uh, who say that Isaiah didn't say anything about the coming Messiah. Well, that's, that's kind of silly. Uh, Isaiah is one of the most messianic of the Old Testament books. Uh, for Isaiah, uh, Messiah will be the God-man. Uh, he is uh, God incarnate, a very, very important uh, idea. Uh, this God-man is born to be the king of eternity. Messiah will be the suffering servant. Uh, in, uh, uh, in Isaiah, we see the, uh, a, a series of servant songs uh, beginning about uh, chapter 42. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the key to all of those is chapter 53, the suffering Messiah. Uh, uh, and the, uh, the idea of Isaiah 53 pointing towards the sufferings of Christ uh, is central to biblical theology. Uh, the suffering servant will give his life for sin in man's place. The idea of the vicarious atonement is clearly taught in Isaiah, so much so that uh, if we're going to do evangelism amongst Jewish people, uh, Isaiah 53 is one of the, the key passages. That's, that's where we get our four laws books for uh, Jewish evangelism. Ultimately, Messiah will return as the righteous judge of all men to usher in the judgments and the blessings of the day of the Lord. Uh, earlier, I gave you an outline of the day of the Lord. There, there's a time of judgment and a long time of blessing in this whole thing that we call the day of the Lord. Uh, the day of the Lord uh, uh, begins with this terrible seven-year tribulation period. The New Testament says the church has no part in that, uh, and so we're raptured out at the beginning of that. Uh, at the end of the tribulation period, a terrible battle will take place that Isaiah uh, gives us quite a few details about. Uh, and that battle will be climaxed by the second coming of Christ, uh, who returns to win the battle, to subjugate the nations, and to establish the thousand-year uh, messianic kingdom. Following that messianic kingdom, another battle uh, and then the eternal state, the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. All of this is Isaiah, and none of it comes uh, from the New Testament. The New Testament builds on this. Uh, so, a bunch of really important stuff. And, uh, the outline of the book is not hard at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's, uh, it's obvious to anybody reading the book 
the first 35 chapters are primarily judgment, not all. Uh, there's, uh, there's quite a bit of uh, uh, messianic prophecy in the first half of the book, but prophecies of condemnation uh, to a large extent. Uh, and there's a lot of woes, there's a lot of condemnations of the nations. There's a hi uh, historical interlude that goes chapters 36 through 39. Uh, uh, two chapters of Hezekiah with Sennacherib, and two chapters that are actually out of historical order that happened about 10 years before uh, when Hezekiah met with uh, Merodach Baladan of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, Babylon. Uh, there's also a bit here of uh, Hezekiah's illness and an extra 15 years. Uh, not the smartest thing that Hezekiah ever did. The prophecies of consolation look toward the future, uh, the uh, uh, return from uh, the Babylonian exile, uh, the uh, uh, suffering servant, uh, the uh, vicarious atonement, uh, and then finally prophecies of uh, end time judgment and blessing, the day of the Lord, uh, looking forward to the uh, hallelujah chorus of the end of the book, which will take us down to the eternal state. Okay, uh, let's, uh, let's see if we can get started in, uh, in Isaiah. Uh, the first 12 chapters of Isaiah are going to take us into, let's see what have I got here, that's that. So we're gonna look at uh, just the first, uh, first little bit here. The uh, first chapter of Isaiah starts out with an indictment. This is Isaiah 1. Uh, and it starts out with the, uh, the title of the book, which is the way, the way it goes. Chapter 1, and verse 1. The vision of Isaiah, or the burden of Isaiah, son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem during the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Uh, so during the, uh, the years of these kings, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, uh, we believe he continued to, uh, to work during the reign of Manasseh. Tradition has it that Manasseh killed Isaiah. It's entirely possible. The prophecy starts right out with a, uh, a courtroom scene. Hear, O heavens, and make with the ears, do that ear thing you do, O earth. Hear, O heavens, give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Uh, and that's the, the introduction to uh, the indictment that is now going to be read about the people of uh, Jerusalem. Uh, children I have reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Okay, so the, the, the first message here uh, is uh, fairly simple. These are my children. Israel is my child. I, I, have, uh, I have given him birth. I have brought him up, and yet uh, he has rebelled against me. Uh, in spite of uh, all of the evidence to the contrary, uh, Israel has rejected God. Uh, so the, uh, when, when we see the ox who knows its owner, uh, an ox can tell which way the wind is blowing. Uh, an, an ox knows what, what his nature is. Uh, he is an ox, uh, and his owner provides food and asks for work and return, and this is natural law. The, uh, the ox understands that. The ox knows his owner. Uh, the, the donkey recognizes that he needs to work a good day's work, and at the end of the day, his, uh, his master will provide food for him and a place to sleep. Uh, this is natural law. Israel should have been able to look at nature itself and see that there is a God in heaven who is worthy of worship. And yet they have rejected God. Uh, 
Israel does not know, my people do not understand. Oi, verse 4, sinful nation, people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They've forsaken the Lord and despised the Holy One of Israel. They're utterly estranged. Why will you be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick, the heart is faint, from the sole of the foot even to the head. There is no soundness, only bruises and sores and wounds are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. Okay, this is the picture of the strong-willed child. Uh, the, uh, 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 <laughs> the strong-willed child wants his own way at whatever cost. Uh, every issue is to die for. Uh, you might ask how Donna and I know anything about strong-willed children, uh, and the fact is that we raised one. Uh, and uh, putting him to bed when he was little was a, a, a bit of a project. We were often uh, concerned that we'd have to take him to the doctor who would see uh, bruises we inadvertently gave him while trying to convince him it was time to go to sleep. Uh, most parents do not enjoy uh, giving their children punishment. Uh, and uh, uh, here is God saying, you are a strong-willed child. Uh, why do you force me to continue thumping you? And speaking uh, to Israel, he, the, the message is larger. You're being thumped, you're, you're being punished by these external enemies, Assyria and Babylon and the, the smaller powers surrounding and Egypt and the rest are uh, uh, surrounding you and beating on you and they're, they're pummeling you. And the reason is because I'm allowing you to be chastised for your sin. Uh, when the book of Hebrews says it's a fearful thing for a believer to fall into the hands of a living God. This does not mean that God is simply going to end the relationship with us and walk away. Oh no, it's way worse than that. Our salvation continues, but God allows the punishment to go on, uh, the uh, 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 chastisement uh, to go on. So, that's what chapter one is about. The end of uh, chapter one, uh, it, it, well, not quite the end, but uh, the, the high point of chapter one uh, comes in the, the call to reach a verdict in verse 18 and 19. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. That's a fairly clear thing. It's, uh, it says we need to come to a judgment here. We need to come to a judicial conclusion. Uh, I can forgive your sins and you can have the best of the land, or you can turn away and rebel and be eaten by the sword. Uh, it, it's a stark contrast. Uh, and interestingly, the, uh, the northern kingdom, uh, which was not the object of this prophecy, but the northern kingdom chose to continue to rebel against God, and they were eaten by the sword, 722. Uh, the southern kingdom has a larger number of good kings. Both Uzziah and Hezekiah were good guys. Uh, and during the, uh, uh, the whole reign of, uh, or the, the whole career of Isaiah, there was this mixture of good and bad. Uh, King uh, uh, Jotham is kind of a nobody. Uh, the uh, uh, Ahaz is a real bad guy. Uh, a weakling of a king and not much of a king. Chapter 2 of Isaiah uh, is uh, in some ways out of place. It's, a, it's an odd uh, uh, place for this particular 
uh, uh, passage, but there it is. It begins uh, three chapters of a vision of uh, the uh, uh, day of the Lord. It shall come to pass. This is verse two. Uh, uh, the chapter is introduced with the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. This, this means that this is a separate vision from what's going on in chapter one. And it may or may not be in chronological sequence. Yeah. Not that that matters. It will come to pass in the latter days. And the latter days uh, are the days of the end. Now, when is that? Probably the day of the Lord. Uh, they, and uh, specifically, uh, this, this passage um, is uh, uh, about uh, the messianic kingdom that is a part of the day of the Lord. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord. Now, the house of the Lord is the temple. The mountain of the house of the Lord is Mount Zion. Uh, and uh, the, the photograph in the background, this picture has Mount Zion on it. That's the location of the Temple Mount. So the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. So here's a picture in the last days, the, uh, the Temple Mount will, will be restored. And that means Jerusalem will be restored. People wonder sometimes why it's necessary uh, for uh, the people of Israel to be reestablished in that particular piece of uh, real estate. Uh, after all, uh, the Arabs who live there uh, would, uh, would be much happier if all of the Jews would just die and go away. Uh, and in fact, the Jewish people today are quite a large pain in the neck for most of the world. Uh, they're, uh, they're a very interesting people. Uh, they're not Christian people. Uh, they're not particularly godly. They're a very secular nation. Uh, and uh, it's, it's tempting to just tell them to uh, go pound sand. They, they, can have, uh, they can have a couple of hundred square miles of Arizona or someplace uh, and go build a nation there. Uh, but the biblical text is very specific about the land of Israel. Uh, and at the end of history, the land of Israel will be the scene of the messianic kingdom. Messiah himself, Jesus, after his second coming, will establish the temple, what we call sometimes the millennial temple, uh, and a palace on Mount Zion. And we're told here, all of the nations will flow up to uh, Jerusalem, will come to Israel, will be the center of, uh, of a worldwide kingdom. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that me, we may walk in his paths. Uh, so the picture of the flow here is of all the nations coming up to hear the word of God in Jerusalem. And then presumably they're going to go back home and uh, teach their fellow men. Uh, that's the picture. Uh, the word of the, uh, for out of Zion shall go the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall be, he, the Messiah, shall be a judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many people. Uh, this suggests that the nations will still have the occasional dispute. During the messianic kingdom, there will still be a mixture of saved and unsaved people. We can demonstrate that much later on in the book of Revelation. But there, this is not heaven. Uh, this is mortal men with all the mortal problems, including sin. Uh, and uh, he will judge between the nations, dis uh, decide disputes for many peoples, 
and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Oh, now that's good news. Uh, the swords into plowshares uh, and uh, spears into pruning hooks means that their weapons of war will uh, no longer be the, the main focus of their industry. Instead, they will, uh, they will take their, their industry and their wealth and produce um, uh, tools for prosperity, for farming. Uh, nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So a, a thousand years of peace and prosperity and happiness with no wars. That, that's a good thing. Now, interestingly, uh, the uh, United Nations in New York City uh, has uh, a portion of uh, this verse. Uh, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Uh, and uh, nation shall not lift up sword against nation. That part of this verse is uh, chiseled in stone in the United Nations. Uh, very significantly, the rest of this chapter is not quoted by the United Nations. Because the, the peace that all of us desire does not come because of a debating club in New York. It does not come because of worldwide socialism or communism. It does not come because of, uh, of a globalist one world government. Uh, peace and prosperity uh, come because Messiah has triumphed and has established his kingdom. Uh, without the coming of the Messiah, uh, none of the rest of it would make any difference at all. Uh, peace and prosperity is not not the not the result of politicians and economists. Uh, peace and prosperity is the result of the work of the Messiah in our lives, first of all. Anyway, that's uh, that's what this one is about. Uh, verse five. O oh, house of Jacob, come let us walk in the light of the Lord. If these things are true, how should we live? We should live as worshipers of God. Okay, uh, the, the latter part of chapter 2 uh, speaks of the judgment of the day of the Lord. And uh, there's quite a bit here. Chapters uh, 2 and uh, 3 and 4 uh, are... Uh, 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 a judgment time. But in the midst of all of that, the branch of the Lord is glorified. The end of chapter four, uh, interesting. Uh, in that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land shall be the pride and the honor of survivors in Israel. Uh, so the, the, the branch of the Lord, it, it kind of an interesting line. Uh, we're not entirely sure what that means. We see that also in Jeremiah, uh, it is entirely possible that uh, there's some relationship to the John 15 vineyard passage. We've got a vineyard passage in uh, uh, chapter five. Uh, the, the vineyard of God is Israel. I am the vine, you are the branches, Jesus says to his disciples. Uh, well, which branch is this? Is, uh, is the Messiah the branch? That's the easiest way to take this, but there, there are some problems. But anyway, the Lord will create over the whole site of Mount Zion, over all of her assemblies, a cloud by day and a smoke and a flaming fire by night. That's an image of the Exodus. And over all the glory, there will be a canopy. Wow. You know, what, what a great vision. Uh, chapter 5. Let me sing for my beloved a love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it with st of stones and planted it with choice vines and built a watchtower in the midst of it. He looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded only wild grapes. Now, O oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there for me to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? 
when I looked for it to yield grapes, it yielded only wild grapes, sour grapes. How awful. Uh, so this is the vineyard song. We, uh, we see the vineyard in the Old Testament as normally a symbol for Israel. Uh, this is where uh, uh, Ezekiel is also going. He talks about the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the vineyard that doesn't yield grapes. It's only good for burning now. Uh, uh, John 15, Jesus uses the same illustration. And we really can't understand John 15 without uh, this foundation. Uh, God treats his people like a vineyard. He, he expects us to produce fruit. Galatians speaks of the fruit of the Spirit. If indeed we take our life from the Spirit of God, then the fruit of our lives ought to be evident. Anyone who looks can see the difference between good fruit and bad fruit. Uh, uh, so if, if you see a man uh, uh, married to his wife, raising children, working hard at his job, uh, providing for his family, uh, leading them all to church, you've got a clue there that perhaps this, this is a good guy. Uh, maybe this is someone in whom the Spirit of God lives. Uh, if, you, if you see a man who is most of the time drunk and disorderly, starts riots, he hits people in taverns, uh, uh, he uh, uh, has, uh, uh, has been uh, uh, the man in uh, several different households but has never married anybody, uh, you have to ask yourself, you know, is it possible that he's a man of God? Well, no, he's not. <laughs> You can, you can tell by the fruits, and there are gradations of fruits in between those, uh, those extremes. Uh, uh, and we, can, uh, we can learn to, we all ought to be fruit inspectors uh, in, in the sense that we're, uh, we're looking at our own lives. You know, what kind of fruit am I producing in my life? And we're looking for people that we want to associate with. You know, who do I look up to? Am I looking up to heroes in my life uh, who are worthy of that? Uh, I'm, I'm very tired of uh, Americans in particular. I, I don't know if uh, Italians or Filipinos have the same problem of looking up to sports heroes. Uh, who are really not very nice people. Uh, they make a lot of money and they, uh, they're fun to watch play, uh, but they're just playing a game. They're not very important people. Uh, and when, in addition, they're not godly people, uh, I don't think they deserve the praise that they often hear. Uh, but that's just my opinion. Uh, some people think a, a good soccer player is a good soccer player and forget the rest. Uh, but I, I'm not going to go there. Uh, chapter six is the, uh, uh, the call of Isaiah. Now, a chronological note, um, we're not entirely sure what to do with Isaiah chapter six as far as the chronology. Does this happen before or after the first five chapters of the book? Uh, my opinion, is that the first five chapters of the book are written before, uh, that these actually are written during uh, King Uzziah's reign. Isaiah actually says that he served during Uzziah's reign. So the, the call seems to have come sometime into Isaiah's ministry. Now that provides some other problems for me, uh, but I think they're smaller problems. So that's where I put it. Uh, and we see the, uh, uh, the call of Isaiah here uh, very, very uh, uh, in his memorable words. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. Now, who did he see? He saw the king of reality. Isaiah starts off by uh, contrasting two kings. King Uzziah lived a long time. He reigned over Judah. It was a very good king. Uh, he caused P 
peace and prosperity to break out everywhere. King Uzziah was a very good and reasonably godly king, but King Uzziah died. And in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord who doesn't die, when who reigns on the throne in heaven forever. So here he's speaking of a vision of God. I saw the Lord seated upon a throne, high and lifted up with the train of his robe, filling the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. The seraphim are a kind of angel. The word seraph in Hebrew uh, is uh, the verb to burn. Uh, so seraphim is a, is a participle. It means burning ones. Uh, the, uh, the seraphs or seraphim, uh, the plural, uh, are angels uh, who are, uh, are heated to the point of incandescence. They're glowing, they're, they're burning uh, with light because of their, uh, uh, their, their position near the throne of God. A totally um, amazing uh, sight. C.S. Lewis has gone so far as to say that the stars that we see in heaven are actually associated uh, with the seraphim. Uh, I kind of like that, but it's, it's a difficult position to hold. You know, there's no way we can prove that. Uh, the stars really are big balls of hydrogen and helium. So they're not angels, literally, uh, but are they associated with the angels? I kind of like that. Uh, it's something to think about. And the one was calling out to another. Each one of them had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And I don't know how that works. Uh, and uh, they called out to one another, a kind of antiphonal chorus. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The fullness of all the earth is his glory. Holy, holy, holy is ungrammatical. In Hebrew, if you want to emphasize something, you say it twice. Like, for instance, king of kings or holy of holies. How holy is it? Well, it's really, really holy. So it is holy, holy. Never anywhere else in the Old Testament do we see a repetition three times. Uh, the angels are saying, holy, holy, holy. Uh, at, uh, at Qumran, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, contain an Isaiah scroll, the great Isaiah scroll of Qumran, 1Q Isaiah A. Uh, the scribe who did that scroll felt the need to make a correction. And so he puts in only two holies uh, because this is most ungrammatically holy. Uh, this is a, 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 how holy is God? Well, he's holy, 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 really, really holy, uh, holier than you can imagine. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Lord of hosts means the, uh, the king of all of the hosts of heaven. The whole earth is full of his glory. Everywhere you look, you cannot miss the character of God himself. And with this, the foundations and the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. The house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, I'm lost. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seraphs, flew to me having in his hand a burning coal. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. It is removed. Your sin is atoned for. Uh, and a whole bunch of uh, uh, stuff going on there. Isaiah's sin is forgiven. Uh, and, uh, so in, in a sense, this is this is Isaiah's salvation event, uh, which again makes me wonder where it fits chronologically. The commission at this point, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. And the, the mission, Isaiah's commission is not a very happy one. 
He said, make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts <laughs> and turn and be healed. So it's an unhappy commission. You're going to preach to these people, but they are not going to listen. But he says, how long? How long, O Lord? And God said, until the cities lie waste without inhabitants, the houses without people, and the land a desolate waste, the Lord removes people far away. And although a tenth remain in it, it will be burned like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. But the holy seed is in its stump. Okay, so the remnant of Israel will be left over from judgment. And that holy seed is the Messiah. So in the, uh, here's the image again. Now I'm going to stop my share at this point. Uh, the image here is uh, a, a very important, and it comes back to the, the classic biblical concept. Uh, there is a, a whole of Israel that is under the wrath of God. Judgment is coming. The wrath of God is coming. Uh, God is coming to destroy. All of this is true. Uh, but in the midst of that, we're going to find grace. So grace is the exception to the wrath of God. Grace for the remnant. Wrath for the majority. Uh, and Isaiah is nothing if not uh, uh, an exposition of this contrast. Uh, there is tremendous judgment, tremendous wrath, tremendous bad news. But in the midst of the bad news, the grace of God. Uh, and the grace of God through salvation that provides redemption through the one, the God-man, the creator, the king, the redeemer. Uh, so we'll pick this up uh, with some messianic stuff on uh, Monday. I will attempt, I will really try hard to do the whole book of Isaiah on Monday. Ah. I, I probably can't be done. Good. Donna is over here on my right saying, you can't do that. It will never happen. And she's probably right. Okay, I'm going to unmute everybody. I need to say hi. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad you could all be here. And uh, Donna and I look forward to seeing you again next Monday. So God bless you all. Bye-bye. See you, Don. Bye-bye, Joel. Pastor Joel. Dolly, bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Oscar, Dr. Dr. Sally. Bye, where, Donna. where are everybody? Okay, I see that there they are. I knew they were there. Oscar, you look sleepy. You do need to get some sleep. <laughs> I know you can't go anywhere or do anything, but at least get some sleep. God bless yeah. everybody. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Uh, Good night, everyone. Like you can't pop.